Hebrews chapter number 4. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. And he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now by the time we get to chapter number 4 in the book of Hebrews, starts off the writer of Hebrews, talks about all those that had delivered the word to God's people throughout really all history. He starts with first angels then he makes comparison to Moses then ultimately through about oh I don't know a chapter and a half he gets to the point that if we look at Moses as being better than us if we look at angels as being better than us how much more so the one that commands the angels what to do the one who was made much higher than the angels the only begotten of God himself but then by the time we get to chapter number four He's talking about those promises that he had just finished meet, meeting in chapter number 3. The promises of God. He says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should, should seem to come short of it. Keep in mind the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. That's why it's called Hebrews. You know, I understand that some people try to make the Bible real complicated. Some things pretty cut and dry. Most things are cut and dry. If it's complicated, it's because man got in the way and they don't want to believe what God wrote. But anyway, the Hebrews had many promises. They were God's chosen people. God promised that he would make them a great nation out of Abraham, their father, then through Isaac and Jacob, later Israel, that he would multiply them, that he would bless them, that he would make a place of rest for them. Well, that place of rest, regardless of how many enemies were against them, regardless of whether they were in captivity or whether they were free, whether they were, you know, cross with God or whether they were following after God, there was the promise that if they would humble themselves, if they would repent, if they would seek God's face and enter into his rest, that regardless of what happened in the world, God would take care of them that there would be a place for them. Now, verse number 2 talks about the current generation. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. All those promises that God had given Israel, one, they're still in effect today, but two, they were a forerunner, they were a glimpse of what God promised to do for all men that he had a rest for his people and that one day there would be the one, Jesus, who could reconcile both Jew and Greek unto himself and that there would be a rest for all men. But he says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Many times throughout Israel and the Hebrews' history, you'll find that God, first off, the same instructions were given to every generation. God wasn't changing the, the goalpost on them. Right? The law that God gave was the law that God gave. It did not change. It's still recorded to this day. And it's still true on what God will accept and what God will not accept. Okay? But the word was preached unto them, but did not profit them. So many times... Uh, even though they may have been raised in truth. And then some generations would come along and then the new generation wouldn't know what God thought. So God would raise up a man to preach what thus saith the Lord, repent, return to the old paths. And although the same truth was preached unto them as what we've received today, which was that God expects holiness, now unless you are holy, you are not accepted by God, so many didn't believe it. It was preached, but it wasn't believed. Then, verse number 3, says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. That's the beauty of the term saved. 
you've been saved from the rough and wild and unruly nature of the world, you have entered into the fold or the rest of God. Right? He is the gate. He is the door. But once you're on the other side, you've got rest. He says, we believe and we enter into rest. That doesn't just go to people that are Hebrews. If you like us and use Gentiles, you get saved, you're in the same fold that God's chosen people are. There's only one type of people that God has. That's God's people. Right, we heard not too long ago, right, Brother Jeff Lebbetter preached on the lamb that wasn't perfect, the one that was blotted. What's he get to do? He gets to live. We got added into the flock of God because the perfect lamb was slain. Right, we're the imperfect ones. We're the ones that have a whole lot, list of things that couldn't make us the sacrifice, but because of that, we get to live as one of God's sheep. Not well, he says, we enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. God said it doesn't matter that from the beginning God knew that man was going to sin. That from the very foundation of the world, God knew that you would be born in sin, conceived in sin, you'd be a sinner by practice and a sinner by trade. You chose to be a sinner. Doesn't matter. God will let you into His rest so long as you do it God's way. Doesn't matter that from the beginning of the world, right, when God put, in, you know, in the alpha of time, when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit said, let us make a world, let us make man, they knew that man would fall. They knew that those that didn't believe on Him would not enter into rest. They'd enter into hellfire. They'd enter into the lake of fire. Despite knowing that by making everything, man would choose to still disobey God, God still has rest available. God still has the door open for any to come in this day. That there still and forever will be a rest for those that believe, that trusted God. But say, well, I want to talk about today, verse number two. It says that for un. To us was the gospel preached as well unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, as I read that, that kind of struck me. So I went and I reread it and reread it and I reread it a bunch of times. But when it says that the word that was preached didn't profit them, it didn't say that it didn't profit them because. It wasn't the right word that was being preached. No, they were saying that the word that was preached was what God said. It didn't say that it didn't profit them because it wasn't delivered in the most polite way or the most pleasant way. It's removing all of those standards. The word that was preached was the word that God wanted preached the way that God wanted it preached. It wasn't because they didn't play enough songs before the preacher and that's why it wasn't received. It wasn't because there wasn't a puppet show before the preaching, and that's why the word wasn't received. No, he says there's only one thing that'll cause the preaching of God's word to be of none effect unto you. That it won't profit you anything. And that it's if it's not mixed with faith. It says not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Doesn't matter how much somebody else believes it. Doesn't matter how much somebody else tells you you need it. Doesn't matter if you take it and put it on the shelf in a mason jar until you mix it with faith inside of yourself, it's not going to benefit you. I say that word mixed is what really caught my attention. When you mix something, you can't find any trace of what went into it. Just bear with me for a second. If you take flour and water and a whole bunch of other eggs and everything else and you go to make noodles, pasta, by the time you've got pasta, you can't see where the water stops and the flour starts. Then you can't see where the egg is and where the salt is and anything else that you put in there. You now have pasta. If you take a cake recipe, right, and if you do it from scratch, which is rare nowadays, or you go and you get Betty Crocker's off the shelf, okay, if you start with that mix, you might be able to see when everything's loose, when it's all, you know, dry parts. Well, that looks like flour. 
that looks like sugar this looks like that but by the time you get done mixing it you can't tell what's what because it's no longer flour and sugar and eggs and you know vanilla extract or whatever else you put in it now it's just cake batter and if you put the cake batter in the oven cake's going to come out you're not going to put it in there and then pull it out and find that all the components have separated again it's been mixed now see if something is mixed that means you get something new on the other end if you mix salt and salt together you're just going to get salt you're not going to get anything different. If you mix water and water, you're not going to get anything different. But if you mix two different things, you get a new thing on the other side. Now, if you're like me, and you think, well, this tastes good and that tastes good, and you mix it, sometimes what you get isn't good on the other end. What you tried to mix together didn't go together. But say here, we're talking about God's Word, and we're talking about faith. God's word is pure. It's true. It's forever settled in heaven. God exalted his own word above his very name. The word of God, for lack of a better term, and doing it a great disservice, is good. Right? Now faith, without the presence of faith in your life, it's impossible to please God. Faith, was not something of your own design you didn't come upon it on your own you didn't just wake up one day and said you know what I'll try this faith thing the Bible teaches us that God gave unto every man a measure of faith faith is not something that belongs to you faith is something that God gave you because he knew that you wouldn't be able to come up with it on your own so faith in itself is a gift of God does not the Bible teach that all the gifts of God are pleasant and good? So if the Word of God's good and faith is good, if you mix them together, whatever comes out is going to be good. To borrow a word from Brother Bobby Cato, if you could put good and good together, then whatever you got is gooder, right? It's just more good. But see, as I was thinking about this, just to prove it to you, See, talks in verse number two about for unto us was the gospel preached when talking about the gospel which is a subset of the word of God when the gospel is mixed with faith then you get salvation Christ could have done everything that Christ did God could have orchestrated everything the exact same way he could have come. He could have been born of a virgin, lived some 33 and a half years, roughly, of sinless perfection, gone to Calvary, died, been buried, rose again. But without faith, there would have been no salvation. He could have paid for it, but there would have been no salvation. The gospel would still exist, but without faith, there would be no salvation. For God chose that through the foolishness of preaching and Ephesians 2, 8, 9. That's not of works. So let's see mention both. It is faith. By grace through faith. The gospel. Everything that Christ did. The opportunity for salvation. That's grace. But through faith. You got to mix the gospel with faith in order to get salvation. You separate them through. You got faith. You got the gospel. No salvation. Put them together. You're saved. Right? Same thing, go back one more verse. Verse number one, For let us hear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. The very promise that God made a rest, a place for you to enter into the family of God. If you don't believe it, you're not entering into the rest. If it's not mixed in you with faith, then you're going to come short of it, as the end of the verse tells us. If you don't believe that something exists, then you're not going to strive for it. You're not going to look for it. You're not going to try and position yourself to where you end up there. If I gave you instructions to where you needed to go, but you saw a road name on there that you thought didn't exist, you're not going to follow my instructions, my directions. Right? Well, the very promises of God, unless they're mixed with faith, they do not profit you anything. Right, so what the Lord's up this morning, we're just going to teach on mixing things with faith. Mixing them with faith. 
talking about where you don't see what it was before and the faith that you mixed in with it, all that you're left is with something new. Because if you mix faith, which God gave you, with something that God instructed you, wrote down, had preached unto you the very Word of God, then the finished work in you is going to be something new. And I kind of noticed a little bit of a pattern. See, it was by salvation that we receive newness of life. And as we have newness of life, we get these things called the fruit of the Spirit. Just to pick a few. What is love? Well, love is an outward expression of an emotion that you feel inwardly. But see, before you got saved, you didn't know what love was. The Bible tells us that God loved us with an everlasting love, that long before we ever existed, He knew us. Right? That He loved us on purpose, but you weren't able to receive it until after you got saved. Until you fell under conviction and God started telling you that He loved you, some of you didn't even believe it when He started telling you. It took Him a while to work on you until you really believed that He would do what He promised that He would do for you. Well, once we get saved, once you've received the love of God, and then you start reading where we're supposed to show the love of God to others, that we are to love the brethren, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, that the world would know that we were His disciples, because we have a love one for another. When you start taking the received love, and then you start mixing it with faith and saying, Lord, I believe I'm supposed to love that way. I don't know how to love that way. All I know is that that's the way you love me. So I'm just going to believe that you can make me love the way that I'm supposed to love. You know what you get? You get the fruit of the Spirit. You get joy. One of the evidence that somebody got saved is one, that they're going to love people. Two, that they're going to have joy in their life. Well, what is joy? Joy is for lack of a better term, it's a state of lifestyle. We know it's not happiness. Happiness is temporary. Joy is a state of being. That you can have joy when the world thinks that you should. Well, why is that? Because we've already mentioned it. The very promises of God, when mixed with faith, that it's one thing for somebody to say, you know, God met my needs this week. But when you realize that God promised to meet your needs every day, and you start mixing it with faith deep down inside of you, then on the days where you don't know where your needs are going to come from, you can still have this thing called joy. Why is that? Because you know that God's going to meet them. But what's that come from? You've mixed God's promises with faith in your life, and that turns into this thing called assurance. It's one thing for God to promise it. It's another thing for you to believe it. And when it gets mixed with faith so much that it's just now a part of you, doesn't matter what happens to you in the world, doesn't matter what anybody else tells you, you know what God said on it, so you have assurance that it's going to come true. You've had experiences where before He's come through. In fact, there's never been a time that He hadn't come through. But knowing that and believing it are two different things. Assurance is what can put on that garment of praise in the spirit of heaviness assurance is what can cause you to shout even though you feel like crying assurance is what will cause you to take one step after you think you've taken all the steps that you can you're just going to try to go because you know that God promised he'd never leave you nor forsake you he promised that for anything to get to you it'd have to go through the father's hand and Jesus' hand that he's got a hedge that the devil can't break and that if it has occurred in your life, there is a reason for it. It's not to cripple you, it is to make you stronger. It is to prove you to those around you that your testimony is true. That when push comes to shove, you're going to believe and you're going to continue to follow after what God has given you. That doesn't just happen because something was preached to you. It's because the promise has to be mixed with faith. But, let's look at something else. When you start mixing things with faith, as I said, something new 
comes as a result of it. Because the way that God intended things is that there are works, there are decisions, there are choices that you make, and then you reap the consequences. Do you think it's any mistake that he said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. How did God form this galaxy, this universe, the world that we live in? God framed it with some supernatural, all-encompassing rules. One of them is that whatever you do, there's going to be consequences, and you've got to deal with them. Can't get away from it. So be not deceived. God is not mocked. That's still true. But when you mix faith with something else, there's going to be a result. Well, when you mix two things that are complementary, you get something new. But every now and then, you can try and mix two things that are direct opposites, and they cancel each other out. It's as if nothing's left in the bottom of the pan. Right? I, I didn't take that many chemistry classes. And uh, yesterday, I was trying to rack my brain thinking of an example. Couldn't think of one, because it's been too long, and I don't remember all them blah, 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 names of elements. Right, and no, I wasn't speaking in tongues. I was just hillbilly trying to remember what the periodic table was. Anyway, there are things that are chemically exact opposites. If you put them in a pan, nothing's left. They truly cancel each other out. But the best example that I could think of was. If you take an acid, and then you take this thing called a base, and you mix them together, and they're neutral. They cancel each other out. You put a strip in there to test it, and it says, we can't find either one of them. It's gone. It's neutral. pH is back to where it's not going to hurt you anymore. Right? Well, if you mix faith with unbelief, they cancel each other out. Doesn't matter how much faith you have, if you have more unbelief. Because if you try to mix faith with the Word of God, but you mix an unbelief in there with it, all you've got left is the Word of God. The disbelief cancels out the belief. And we've already established in verse number 2 that for unto us was the gospel preached as well unto them, but the Word preached did not profit them. The Word was there for them. But the Word on its own didn't do them any good. When you start mixing faith with the Word, but just as much faith that you have, you have unbelief. They're attached. The opposite sides of the same coin. If you go to put faith in there, you've got faith and unfaith. There's the things you believe, and then there's the things that you don't believe. Keep in mind, we're not doing this in a controlled experience. It says did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them. You're mixing the Word with yourself. And if all you have to mix it with on the inside of you is faith, it's going to be for your benefit. But if you've got unbelief attached to that faith, all you're going to have is the Word. Now the psalmist said, that Word if I hid my heart, but that's not where the verse ended. The Word on its own being hid, he had it all memorized, he could, you know, the Pharisees had the first five books of what we call the Bible or the Pentateuch committed to memory. They knew the law of God. But the word on its own did not profit them. The psalmist said, Thy word if I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. The word was added to himself because he believed that that's the way he needed to live. So he added the word to himself so he would know what God expected so he could do what God accepted. Well, if you mix the Word with faith, but there's unbelief in you, all you're left is the Word. In the last days, there would be a famine for the what? Hearing of the Word of God. Hearing truly is when the Word is mixed with faith. Because then it becomes something new in your life. The Word was recorded, it's the same. Still as potent, still as powerful. Right? There's a half that hadn't been recorded in, or that hadn't been told in heaven. 
it's recorded forevermore. Right, but the, the half that we do have, you know why you have it? Because God knew you needed it. But you can take all the word you want to and start mixing it with yourself, but if there's more disbelief than there is belief, then you're not going to get the desired outcome. It's going to cancel out. You can put ice into a very, very hot pan trying to get water, but if the pan's too hot, it's just going to turn straight into steam. It skips the water phase. I believe that's called going super critical. Okay, it skips a state of matter and just goes to something different. Well, if you've got more unbelief or a lack of faith than you do faith, when you go to mix that ingredient into there, there's going to be more unbelief left over and all you've got is unbelief in the Word of God. That's not going to result in anything new. That's been the same since the dawn of time. Since Eve heard what God said, then heard what the serpent said, and she didn't believe that what God said was true. Ever since then, you know what the result has been? Sin. Disobedience. Unholiness. We know how that comes out. The only thing that can change is to have more faith than you do not faith. There's a lot of things that will cause you not to have faith. There's a lot of things that will cause you to doubt. A lot of things that will cause you to second guess. It could be the same situation, but now you're looking at it from a different angle. And just that sensation of discomfort, being outside of your comfort zone, will cause you to think, well, is this going to work this time? Well, did it work last time? Are not his ways the same? He changes not. But yet, just looking at it from a different angle calls us on the inside to stir some unbelief when we start mixing faith with the Word. The only way to cancel out unbelief, you're always going to have some unbelief. We're in this flesh. This flesh doesn't want to believe God. This flesh wants to doubt God. This flesh wants to disobey God. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is the new man than the old man because he promised that he made you a king and a priest to rule and reign over this body. He promised that he equipped you with everything that you need in his word in order to reign in that old man. Well, solution's very simple. It's just like God, he gave it to us in his word. But that woman that came unto Jesus said, Beliefs, what you need. She says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know what that woman believed? She believed that Jesus was what she needed. She had a whole bunch of things that had excuses and reasons and things that her flesh were throwing up on why not to believe in Jesus. But she said, Lord, I believe that you're the answer enough that not only are you what I need, but you can help me get to where I need to be in order to receive what you want me to receive. Jesus said he hadn't found faith like that in all Israel. See, the key is not being a you know, super holy person, getting a halo to where all that you have in your life is faith. No, Jesus knew that on our own we wouldn't be enough to live as thus saith the Lord even after we got saved. That's why he gave you the Holy Ghost. In fact, we've said it time and time again, Jesus said that he must go so that the Comforter could come, that it was more profitable, more beneficial, it was better for the Holy Ghost to come than for Jesus to still be robed in flesh and walking around on the earth today. So, what's the key? If unbelief's always going to be a part of us, the key is that you don't do the mixing. If left to your hands, the arm of flesh is going to fail you. It doesn't say that they didn't mix the word with faith. It says that the word wasn't mixed with faith in them. They weren't the ones doing the baking or the mixing. That was God. 
See, the problem is when you try to mix what God said with what you think or what you believe, there's always going to be an issue. God winks at our ignorance. We think that we've figured out what God expects or what God wants. If God knew that you'd be able to figure out what God wanted from your life, why would you have the Holy Ghost to lead and guide you? That we're so simple that we can't even understand how simple we are. We're so dumb, Brother Ron, that we're just smart enough to think that we've got it figured out. But there's a true thing, there's a phenomenon with people, what do they call it? I can't remember. I'll think of it here in a second. But it's a chart. The chart is, on this direction, how much you actually know. And then on this side, it's how confident you are that you are correct. And as you start with nothing, it spikes real high real quick. And then, as you get to about, oh, here, it comes all the way back down to the bottom again. And then it's a slow increase the more that you learn. Don't know what it is about people. We think that as soon as we know a little bit about something, we know everything. That's why when somebody checks their cell phone and goes to Google for two web pages, all of a sudden they are the world's expert on everything. Okay, but after they get humbled, then they realize, oh, there's a whole lot that I don't know. And it's really not until you get to them people that have like doctorate degrees and been doing stuff for like 20 years on top of that, that then they're pretty confident that they actually know what's going on. Because the more you learn, you start realizing, oh, I do not know. See, it's not about what you can figure out. It's about what God promised that he would do. It's not what you can do for God. It's what God can do in you. So when you ask God to mix that word with faith, saying, Lord, I know that this flesh doesn't want to believe it. But Lord, I pray that you'd humble me, one. But two, you'd keep me humble. And three, you'd help my unbelief. Lord, I know part of me doesn't want to believe this, but my spirit does want to believe this. You'll never convince the flesh that it's wrong. Right? The flesh left unchecked, it's full of pride. It's full of self. And it'll look itself in the mirror and say, man, I look pretty good today. But the Spirit, through looking at itself as in a glass in the Word of God, the Spirit is all too aware of how needy we really are. So when it comes to mixing things with faith, who do you want doing the mixing? you want God to do it or do you want to try and do it? So many people have tried to mix the Word of God with their faith on their own, and it always ends up a mess. Why do you think we got so many different denominations that claim to be Christians today in just America alone? I think we're up to over 400. Claim that, yep, we believe in Christ. Well, what do you believe? Well, we can't agree on that. Now, it's not that complicated. 66 books some of them only a page long all state one thing you need to repent and believe on Christ it's not that complicated then where did the complication come man started trying mixing their faith with the word of God but yet I find that the brethren are meant to dwell in unity that if God did the mixing it's always going to come out the exact same way doesn't matter where you heard it doesn't matter where it was that you ask God to start mixing it into your life but the end product is always comes out the same why do you go to certain restaurants because you know that if you order this thing that it's going to come out the same way that you did last time if you thought you was going to get something different every time why would you go right, well when God does the mixing the end result is always what God desired and you'll find that if you just submit to whatever God desired in your life, that that mixing is going to be for your better. Not well, it says the word preached in verse number 2, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 
Now see, sometimes the reason that things aren't mixed with faith is because you hear it, but you're just not convinced that you need it. But I know better. I did not need to eat ice cream yesterday. I wanted to, did not need to. Right? There are many things in our life we know we don't need them, but we do them anyway. And then there's a whole bunch of other things, like, I don't know, working out and exercise, bodily profit, or bodily exercise profit a little, but there is some profit in it. Right? We all know we live in America where like 70% of the people are overweight. Right? We all know that there's things that we could do that would be good for us, but we just don't know. Right? Why? Because you don't think you need to. Well, this, 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 and this are all indicators that you could have health problems one day. Well, yeah, that's one day. I don't need to do it now. We'll address it when it becomes a problem. Right? You say that's ignorant. We all do it every day. If you were really concerned about your own safety, none of y'all would ever get in a car again. Driving a car is one of the most dangerous things you can do to lower your life expectancy. Right? Not, I'm not saying you are a bad driver. Them people's idiots. Right? Y'all remember when they put the roundabout in and everybody looked at it? Well, nobody knew what to do. It's real easy. You go one direction. Right? And then you go around until you get off at where you want to go. If you miss it, just keep going around until you figure it out. Right? You got yourself a little NASCAR race now. It's not that hard. Well, figuring out God's plan is not that hard. It's always been the same. But why doesn't it profit people when they, because they don't think that they need it? If we all really thought that we needed God today, we wouldn't have to have a revival meeting. We'd be in revival. If everybody thought that what God said on something was more important than what man thinks on something, we wouldn't be having some of the silly conversations in America today that people are having with a straight face. Right? Like, I'd understand it if it was done, you know, in parody, and we're like, ha-ha, that's pretty funny. No, parody's out the window. It's gone to the cuckoo's nest out there. Right? Having a debate on, well, which bathroom should this person use? Why do I have to tell you what bathroom? You should know that. Right? I have never asked somebody, which bathroom do I go in? That right? seems pretty simple. Right? But Sidney Weaver will tell you, his son Bryce, he's had a lot of mental issues ever since he's born. He's had, I think, it's, he's up to almost 30 brain surgeries at this point. He's able to function, but even his own son knows which bathroom to go into. Now, that's something God gave you. Common sense. There's a lot of people that. I believe that God, because he is no respecter of the person, gives everybody a little bit of common sense, but some people just chuck it out the window. Why? Because they think they don't need it. But I don't want common sense. I want to go find the new thing. But why do people think that they don't need the word? Because they, listen, they turn on TV and they find a motivational speaker that tells them, well, if you wake up 15 minutes earlier every day and you get on a bike, it's going to improve your mood every day. It'll improve your mood if you've got a good relationship with God. It'll help your outlook on life if your will and God's will are lined up together. Doesn't matter how much you exercise. Doesn't matter if you wake up and you look in the mirror and say, you are important and you are the, you know, you're going to make an impact in the world today. Those are called affirmations, which are weird, Okay. I am what I am by the grace of God. And outside the grace of God, I don't want to be what that would be. I want to be what God desires me to be. There's a lot of things that I have aspired to do throughout my life that God has to sit me down and humble me and say, you don't need that. And usually in varying lengths of time, we get to the same destination, which is, all right, Lord, you were right. At certain points throughout your life, God has to sit you down and say, hey, I want you to do this. Well, Lord, that wasn't anywhere on my radar. You've heard the word. But until you believe that that's what you need to do, it's not going to profit you any. It wasn't mixed in them with faith because they had no reason to believe it in their minds. Oh, I don't need that. So why waste faith on it? 
I believe that God wants me to go out, work a job every day, provide for my family, to be the, the best spiritual leader for my household that I can be, to be the best parent that I can be, to be the best you know, child that I can be, be the best productive member of the church that I can be involved as much as I can. Well, all that may be true. But if you're putting that before what God's trying to instruct you, mold you, and make you into, then all those things aren't going to profit you a plug nickel. Those are all works of the flesh. Because unless your spirit's lined up with the direction that God wants you to be, all that is sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. The reason that it wasn't mixed with faith in them is because they got too big for the britches. They put themselves on what's the word? Marble pillars. Said, look at us. The lay out of seeing church increase with good and have need of nothing. Not realizing that they were poor, blind, and naked. You see it time and time again in Hebrews or in the history of the Hebrews. You see it time and time again in the new churches in the epistles. You see it in the book of Revelation that even just a short time after Jesus had gone, there was a lot of things that them churches were doing right. But all of them, God said, I do have all against you. They had already started tuning out the voice of the Holy Ghost in their life and instead replacing it with the desires of the flesh. The word mixed with faith is always going to yield something new, something fresh, something for you today. Something that you need. Something to help you thrive and grow. But when you start mixing other things in with it, you're going to get an abomination. Now what is an abomination? That's something that God hates. Something that God can't despise. You want to know how much God hates His Word being messed with? Go read the book of Revelations. You find if you add to it, He's going to add all of the sins of man to you. You find if you remove it, He'll remove, your very, or remove from the Word of God, He'll remove your name out of the Lamb's book of life. That's the only way I can find to lose your salvation is to start tampering with God's Word. So how important do you think it is in your life when you hear it and you say, well, I don't need it? You're adding to and taking away from what God has said. I'm not saying that you're physically altering His preserved Word and that you're going out and spreading a false Bible, but you are lying to yourself about what God expects from you. The real reason that the Word is not mixed with faith most often is because people believe they know better than God. I don't know the answer to that one, Brother Lancaster. It's always been, Eve thought she knew better. Adam thought that he'd rather have Eve than God. Cain thought he knew what was a better sacrifice than Abel. We can go down through the line. I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that God's got the answer for you. I can barely understand the parts of me that I can wrap my head around. You know what I've learned, Brother Brian? I got a whole lot of learning left to do. I got a whole lot of flaws that he's still working on removing. And I've got a whole lot of work left to do before we get to glory. Every day I wake up and I find I still need him. I figured that much out. But if I can't even understand my own heart, which is deceitfully wicked, no man can know it, how do you expect that somebody else is going to be able to tell you what God wants in your life? You need to get to the Word where it says that He does all things well. That if any come unto Him, He'll no wise cast them out. That if He puts someone on the potter's wheel, by the time He's done, it's a vessel of honor. And the key is the yield. Now, I know it's not four letters, but most Baptists, Baptists think that the word yield is a four-letter word. But what's that mean? You know, we're just supposed to go through life and not have any... And I didn't say that. Walking hand-in-hand hand with Jesus, but Jesus' hands are on the reins. It's going out and fighting the good fight. Going out and giving it all you got. But you're not the one choosing the direction you go. He says go that way and you go that way as hard as you can until he says go a different way. 
See, true Christianity, it takes a whole lot of pressure off of your shoulders. Paul was in the middle of prison, been in prison for a long time, been trying to be killed a whole lot. Yet before Agrippa, he says, I think myself happy. Why? Because he wasn't worried about where he was physically. He was worried about where he was spiritually. And he knew he was smack dab in the middle of God's will. He knew it was exactly where he needed to be. So he said, King Agrippa, I think myself happy. Why? Because the word had been mixed with faith in Paul's heart. And that had brought about something new. In that case, assurance, joy. He had happiness. How much of the promises of God are you missing out on just because it hasn't been mixed with faith in your life? Oh, you believe God will meet your needs, but you don't live like it because it hadn't been mixed in you. Imagine how much of the burdens of life could be taken off your shoulders if you just believed God and had it mixed together with faith in your heart, not by yourself, but by God Himself. Mixing the Word with faith, that's what brings about revival. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.